Welcome everyone to another episode of the Common Room Podcast. Today we have another amazing episode, an amazing person on our show, and I'm really, really excited to have her. Her name is Haja. Nice to meet you, Haja, for the second time. <laughs> and I'm very, very excited to have you on this episode today. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. It's very early here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, around 9.30 a.m., right? If I remember correctly. And where exactly are you? I'm in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Amazing, amazing. Okay, before we dive a little bit more into your story, we always like to start with a little rapid fire round just so that our listeners can just see your fun side a little bit. <laughs> um, so I just have four questions for you. Really random, really simple. So the first question I have is, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Do you like ice cream? <laughs> I I love ice cream, but I only eat one flavor, and that's vanilla. Oh really? Oh my god! Okay, so you don't eat any other flavor of ice cream? Oh my god! No. Okay, okay, <laughs> amazing, amazing. Okay, and if you could recommend a book or movie to our audience, what would it be? Um, I'll recommend Kalhona Ho. It's an Indian movie. Oh my it. god! <laughs> I love that movie as well. Oh my God, I can't believe you know it. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, it is a very famous movie around the world. Um, okay, and when during the day are you the most productive? Between the hours of one to seven. In the, during the day, not during the yeah. night. <laughs> okay. Oh amazing. no. Some, some people are, are really heavy night owls. So I was wondering. Okay. And who is your biggest inspiration or role model? Um, I'll say my moms. I have two moms. So they're my inspiration. Oh my God. That's amazing. I love that. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay. Well, this comes to the end of our rapid fire. Thank you so much for your amazing answers. Let's move on now to actually digging deep into who is Haja, um, the environmentalist, the person, the woman. Okay. So let's begin. Uh, Haja, I actually got to know about you through a really close friend of mine, a childhood friend of mine who studied with you in college. Can you tell us a little bit about where you went to university and what you actually studied? Yeah, so I love Arushi, by the way, as well. Um, <laughs> shout out to Arushi. <laughs> shout out to her. I went to college in upstate New York, um, Skidmore College. It's a liberal arts college in Saratoga Springs. And I majored in environmental studies. Amazing, amazing. I also studied actually environmental science in the Netherlands. So I'm really curious, what exactly was the curriculum like? How did it work with the, yeah, with the major that you did? Actually, I personally chose a liberal arts because there was enough room to explore and do critical thinking and research and blend in a community. Um, so it was very interdisciplinary. I took classes that focused on development, on women, on food, on entrepreneurship. I, I just took a lot of interdisciplinary classes that got me, um, how do I say, enlightened about a lot of topics. So, but all one thing that really cut across was how they all relate to the environment, which was really amazing. Wow, that's amazing. And what made you want to study environmental studies? So um, I got a scholarship in 2015 to study in Norway. I was on the medical track. I wanted to be a doctor. I really wanted to be. So I took the bios and the chemistries. But then I took this class called Development Studies, which I thought was geography, was really more than geography. So it sparked my interest in environmental studies. I went to a liberal arts because um, I wanted to explore more. And after the 2017 mudslide in Freetown that displaced like thousands of people and killed over a thousand people, I just decided I'm going to major in the environment and anything else will come after. Wow, that's, that's so powerful. So let's move on then to the next question. So after you graduated, because uh, you graduated this year, correct? Yes, I did in May. In May. And then you went straight back to Freetown? Yes, I did. And what are you doing right now? So I'm currently doing a Princeton Africa Fellowship with um, El Kony Center in uh, Kitale, Kenya. And uh, I'm running my business on the side. 
Wow. Okay. Lots to unpack there. But the first thing I would like to ask, what exactly is this Princeton Fellowship? How does it work? So um, the Princeton Africa Fellowship is a 12-month fellowship that um, mm-hmm. focuses on development per se within the African continent. So um, I think it's about 20 of us. We're paired with a developmental organization within the African continent based on our interests and skills. And for the rest of the 12 months, it's uh, like a work learning opportunity. It's not a full-time job. At the same time, it's not going to school. So it's a mixture of both. Wow, amazing. And did you always know that you wanted to do a fellowship after you graduated or was it something that came in your path? Um, well, since my junior year, I knew I wanted to do the Princeton in Africa Fellowship. <laughs> I, I really started reading into it and seeing what they were doing. And I was very interested in it. Amazing. Amazing. And you also mentioned that you run a business. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What is it called? What does it do? Yes. So um, my business is called Uman for Uman. And we make and sell reusable sanitary pads in Sierra Leone. And hopefully we go continental and global soon. So um, when I was at Skidmore, I launched my business in 2019 after applying for a seed funding through a business competition. Amazing. And what was sort of the motivating factor to start this business? And why in this specific field? Was it something that you saw that was needed in the market? especially in Freetown? So like I said, I went to Norway in 2015 and I just got to explore and experience there's so many period products out there. And it sparked my interest in period poverty and sustainable period products. Um, So when I went to the US, I started using reusable pads and I realized, oh my God, this is an option, especially for the girls and women back home. Um, took entrepreneurship classes, took sewing classes, started making my prototypes. And um, it's just it's just a way to introduce a sustainable product to the market. So there are plenty of choices out there because the only option in Sierra Leone, not the only, but the prevalent option, like the most used, over 90% use disposable pads, which are not healthy. And at the same time, we like menstrual health education. So with Uman for Uman, we try not only to produce reusable pads, but also teach girls about menstrual hygiene. Amazing. Amazing. The thing that stood out to me from what you just said was that you took sewing classes and then you started making your own prototypes. That's amazing. Like how long did it take you to learn how to actually make a cloth pad from scratch? Yeah. um, When I say sewing classes, I mostly mean YouTube. (laughs) <laughs> I was in Norway when I, when I did my first sewing lesson. It was through a project-based learning week. I made a dress. And when I wow. went to the U.S. in 2017, I realized, oh, I want to sew. So <laughs> I want to sew. So. so I bought my first sewing machine and I started just making stuff and uh, that- watching videos and ask around, read the manual, you know, whatever I needed. I just looked it up mostly and it worked, honestly. Honestly, that's super inspiring, especially for me, like also just thinking about it, like India also has very, very poor menstrual sort of systems in place in terms of period products. Uh, Yeah, also the education there is just very, very poor. Not a lot of people have good um, menstrual hygiene or knowledge about proper menstrual hygiene. So I think... What you're doing is really, really great and important for a lot of people who menstruate. So thank you so much for, yeah, for the work that you do. Okay, well, I wanted to sort of steer this conversation into like unpacking how you feel about the term environmentalist. So first, would you consider yourself an environmentalist? Having formally studied it, working in the space, would you consider yourself an environmentalist? I, I, I can still remember graduating and editing my Instagram post. I'm like, shall I say, yeah, I'm now an environmentalist. Does getting an environmental studies degree make you an environmentalist? And then I was just, okay, I, I'm an environmental studies graduate. That's what I posted. But then I think the term environmentalist is very elitist. 
and also has a lot to it like with what you eat what you do what you wear and I feel like I am not there yet with my everyday actions um, to call myself an environmentalist but based on what I do at a community level at at the same time my day-to-day life and the advocacy part I feel like I would want to call myself an environmentalist but is that just a label I attach to myself for example I identify as a feminist and I'll just use that everywhere but I feel like with the word environmentalist I have to like play my cards right because when you google environmentalist it's just a lot of white people or people who've planted a million trees or people <laughs> you know it's it's just a greater ton bags and all and I'm like okay I'm really not there yet but it's a time I identify with at least I I, I want to consider it a spectrum and I feel I fall in between I love that I love what you mentioned that it's an elitist term can you like explain or elaborate what you mean by that I mean um oh wow oh <laughs> uh, like just if you were to google top 10 environmentalists a certain demographic shows up with a certain form of education with a certain background so it begs to question our place in this world that's why for the first time in my life when i learned about wangari matai the kenyan ecofeminist and environmentalist and activist i was like okay now i can relate with this because environmentalism for everyone means something else you know when we talk about the environment from mostly the global north conversations i've had it's about the melting ice caps you know it's about um global warming climate change which is definitely a thing but i do not hear about the brown side of the environment you know about women who go miles and miles every day to get water about children who are not going to school because their island is sinking people from you know um from kribas people from uh, fiji uh people from even mozambique who recently experienced cyclone ida and all its consequences you know so it makes me question at what rate we need to be especially from the global south to fully fit as important stakeholders like forefront stakeholders in the environmentalist conversation so it's just all of that there's a lot of unpacking to do honestly that's such powerful words from you also because just coming back to this term that you said that environmentalism is a spectrum Uh, I think it's so important that you said that also because you mentioned that you sometimes find it hard to um yeah fully lean into this label just because in your everyday actions sometimes you feel like you're not really there yet versus on a community level where you're actually doing phenomenal things for your community in terms of the environment um yeah how do you feel about that do you think like you need to be doing everything like from your day to day to the week to year to community to global level do you need to be doing good practicing good environmental values at every single level to be an environmentalist or do you think that what you're doing is enough um because yeah you're a human being and this is as much as one person can go at the moment yeah um for our environment what we're doing is never enough um <laughs> right i i want to acknowledge that what i am doing what you are doing what everybody is doing is not enough there's so much more we can do that's no right how sustainable you are there are ways you can become more sustainable it's just <clears throat> based on what i learn and planning to practice what i preach i find it very hard especially in this part of the world you know um it's hard because i it, it, that's why i bring in the term elitist and 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 words like privilege for example to switch to a sustainable meal you know cost a lot of money to be vegan to be vegetarian it's a lot of money to wear sustainably it's 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 a lot of money healthy fashion you know healthy consumption to become an eco-friendly human being is expensive and then i find myself in this part of the world which doesn't recycle plastic and i drink water from a water bottle 
every day. Is it my fault? So now I have to risk between getting typhoid or polluting the environment, you know? And um, it's, it's so much, like there's so much, like I use synthetic hair and <laughs> it's just many of the products I use has plastic in them because maybe the ones that are plastic are not available on this part of the world or it's ridiculously expensive and I'm not a rich person. I'm not there yet financially. So I cannot use the triple bottom line approach like effectively people plan a profit. I'd rather maybe focus on some of it while making it more of an intersection. But I always say the more resources and education I have, the more conscious decisions I make. For example, I thrift shop, you know, try to save energy as I can, um, try to reduce um, the plastic products I consume. I feel at this point it's just reducing and reusing, not really recycling for me because my country doesn't recycle. So it's... That's honestly amazing. I mean, uh, I think when I talk, when I'm talking to you now, I just see a lot of, uh, I see a lot of people reflected in your story, right? Also people from India, people from my community um, and that it's, it's, not, it's expensive to be an environmentalist. Being vegan is not cheap. Being, uh, buying sustainably made clothes and shoes is not cheap. And uh, I think that's really important uh, when you look at the contrast between environmentalism in different parts of the world, where in the West, it's very much about being vegan. And yeah, it's about more lifestyle choices that you make versus um, in places like Africa and India, where it's really about clean drinking water and even the, the first aspect of recycling plastic or not using plastic, but a lot of our systems are entrenched in that. So it's really difficult to get out of it. But how do you see it moving forward? Like for you, especially, like, do you see yourself leaning into this label more and more as you make better choices or are able to make better choices because of the systems around you? Or do you think it's something that you first need to change the system before you can actually even get to the aspect of having day-to-day -day actions that make you an environmentalist? Um, I feel like one person cannot change the system. Environmental education for climate action is a necessity. Like we all need it. At the same time, I feel like the resources around you help you make the decisions you will want to make. Let's say I have the education, but I don't have the resources to make all of this, you know, radical decisions or actions I would want to fit into that label. At the same time, I try not to detach myself from that label. I care about the environment. I'm doing what I can. I, I, I teach who I can. I, I take actions in my day-to-day -day life. Like I do some form of activism, whether it's verbal, whether it's through my actions, whether it's, you know, through um, my family. It's just I feel like it's a way of life and just switching from what you've been brought up with to something else. It requires a lot of effort, time and resources. So I, I feel like I should pat myself on the back for every little thing I do. But then at the same time, I'm like, we're all ambassadors of Mother Earth. So I really should not be feeling, you know, accomplished because I'm helping to save the environment. It is my responsibility as a, as a responsible citizen. Now that I have that platform, I just need to work with more people, you know, see how best we can work together to protect or take care of our environment. And I feel it's gonna take time. It's gonna go beyond what I am thinking. Maybe it's not even feasible. Maybe it's more complicated than I think it is. So it's not always going to go as I am expecting it. But at the same time, it's always worth trying. But we really need collective action. And I feel one person is not going to fix everything. Definitely. I completely agree with that. One person cannot do anything from start a business to save the world. Um, and just to round off, do you have any like, yeah, advice to people who are listening in, especially with this whole aspect of breaking stereotypes around environmentalists. Do you think this is a label that we can take back and make powerful, 
make it a tool that people can use to start doing more environmental work. Because what I feel is that a lot of people shy away from the environmentalist label, like you said, because of all these stereotypes that are around it. Um, also the, the aspect of it's never enough, you know, a lot of people actually don't do anything because they're like, oh, it's never, it's never going to be enough. So I'm going to actually not do anything at all. And I think that that actually causes a lot of people to not do stuff, to actually not take action when they can. And a lot of people to not consider themselves environmentalists when they're actually doing things that can support our environment. So what is, how do you feel about this? And what is some thoughts that you have around how we can shape this or change this? Yeah, I, <laughs> that's a very packed question. I'm going to say um, there's not one way to do things. And yeah. if we really believe like it's linear, like A to Z, then no, it's complicated. It's multifaceted it's interdisciplinary you know it's it's a lot happening so I feel like we can question ourselves first of all what do I know what don't I know educate myself use the resources around me to make my day-to-day living better and you know more environmentally friendly then there's also community action there is so much collective action and all of this is not like we have to do it entirely on our own we have to ensure that all of us are coming together to see what we've been doing why hasn't it been working or if it's been working how can it be implemented at a larger scale so um i feel like education i always emphasize on that education is the secret like education is the most powerful tool we can use to change the world, quoting Nelson Mandela or paraphrasing him. So I feel like we need a lot of that. At the same time, I come from a part of the world where we tell people, don't cut down trees, don't burn charcoal, fossil fuel, this, this, and this. And then, okay, I'm not going to cut down trees. I'm not going to do all this. What alternatives are there? For example, you tell somebody, do not use plastics. Well, 800 or 1,000 years to decompose. They all that. That person is going to be like, okay, I won't use it again. But what are the alternatives, you know? And that's where you come in and be like, okay, then you can use reusable pads or menstrual cups or something more environmentally friendly. So you're not just preaching for people to change what they're used to doing, but you're bringing in as an, a disposable pad today. I can access an affordable and healthy a, a, a reusable pad. So it's a win-win situation. And I feel that's most of what the preaching about the environment has to be. It's mostly been, we're harming our environment, we're killing the planet, and it's less of what can we do as responsible citizens to cut down on our actions. If you're going to shame me, provide an alternative solution. But we just have people shaming each other and I'm not, I'm not definitely defending people all i'm saying is if we understand the choices and the alternatives then we definitely can make better options so i feel like in our little communities in our little circles these are like things we can do you know like oh my god you don't need this many clothes oh my god you don't need this much plastic oh you don't need all of that food you're not gonna eat all of it like just be able to let people understand the consequences of their actions, which in turn will help them make better decisions. Yeah. That's amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, And I think a lot of what you said has a lot of powerful messages to a lot of people around the world um, who listen to this podcast. And I hope that they can take away some wisdom from everything that you've said. I know I have. Um, and I'm still very, very in awe of everything that you've done. And I think a lot of what you said, (laughs) a lot of what you said is super important, especially to younger environmentalists, uh, or people who are just looking to make an impact, a positive impact on their community. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, Haja. Thank you for letting me share. (laughs) Amazing. Well, um, I would like to give you the opportunity to say any final words or any final things 
Oh, thank you. Well, I am not only an environmentalist, I'm also an entrepreneur. So um, I just want to reiterate on the fact that I run a social enterprise called Woman for Woman. Um, it's spelled U-M-A-N, number four, U-M-A-N. We have social media platforms on Facebook and Instagram. And we are trying to <laughs> tackle the issue of period poverty. So if you want to know more about what we're doing, you can follow us and um, you can reach out. We can talk, partner, learn more about the environment or, you know, just get to see each other's work. But it was great having me here. And I feel like we need more platforms like this where we can spread ideas and knowledge. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, I'm very, very curious to see how Oman for Oman grows in the future. And we at Common Room will keep a close eye on it. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of The Common Room with Haja. Please follow us on Instagram because we will post a lot of information about her and her stories and also tag her and Oman for Oman so you can also follow her to that. And of course, we will also have a lot of information on our website about her and her business so you can always go to our website which is still under construction but will be out very soon. I would like to thank you once again for listening in and have a nice day.